you hear me okay in the back? Is this on? Yeah, we're good? All right, good. Uh, my name is Jim Lutis. I am the uh, Executive Director of the Pell Center for International Relations and Public Policy and Vice President for Public Research and Initiatives here at Salve Regina University. And can I say, this is a beautiful looking crowd, and I want to thank everybody for taking time to join us tonight. Uh, inside your program is the lineup of events that we have scheduled for the rest of the semester. Take a look. Uh, we're doing something a little different this year. We are only uh, opening registration two weeks in advance. Uh, so if you see something else that you want to come to, make sure you're on our email list uh, or check back to the website two weeks before the event and you can sign up then. Um, we have a really uh, wonderful guest tonight. Uh, I met Dr. Daniela Lamas uh, about four months ago uh, when she, uh, three months ago, I guess, uh, when she came to uh, tape an episode of Story in the Public Square. Uh, she's a, a, a pulmonary and critical care uh, doctor at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And she's also the author of a beautifully written book, uh, You Can Stop Humming Now. Uh, we'll talk to her about the book. Uh, we'll talk to her about uh, her career and health care. Uh, but to get things started, she's going to give us a brief reading uh, from uh, the book, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Daniela Lamas. Thank you so much to everybody for taking the time out to come. Perfect. So I'm going to begin with a little bit of reading. And the scene is, uh, we're in New York City. Um, it's uh, in the cardiac intensive care unit. It's winter, and I've been a doctor just about six months. Sam Newman was hands down the most interesting patient in the ICU. A great learning case, my attending pronounced that first morning. Sam was young and had a particularly nasty form of a rare disease so I should have fought for the opportunity to be involved in even the most banal aspects of his day-to-day -day care. But this young man scared me, and so I avoided him. It was easy to do at first. When we split up the daily scutless tasks, I simply claimed the blood draws and transports and phone calls for the other patients. But one day, my resident told me that the intravenous line in Sam's neck needed to come out. He had started to spike fevers. We didn't know where they were coming from, and since the catheter could represent the entry point for bacteria, one of us had to pull it. I was the intern in charge of procedures that day, so the job was mine. I put it off all morning and threw our lunch of tuna fish and chicken salad sandwiches, hoping that the fevers would subside or the empty pull line box on the list would somehow disappear. But by 1 p.m., the box was still empty. I'm going to go pull the line now, I said to no one in particular. I grabbed one of the pale yellow gowns we wear over our clothes to keep us from transferring antibiotic-resistant bacteria from patient to patient, and I entered his room. I had seen him on rounds each morning, but those exams were brief, and he was often half asleep. Now, for the first time, I took in my patient. His face was swollen, and his arms were bruised from the steroids that had done nothing to stop his heart's self-destruction. He was wearing a hospital gown and compression devices on his legs to prevent blood clots. Hopeful get well cards bearing Hallmark style messages covered the bedside table. Hey, I said, I'm Daniela, one of the interns. I've seen you on morning rounds, but you've generally been sleeping. He was typing on his laptop and barely looked up from the screen. I told him that we needed to take out his central line because it might be the source of his fevers. He shrugged, which I took as a scent. So here's what I'm going to do, I explained. I'm just gonna cut out the stitches. That might hurt a little. And then I'll pull out the line and hold pressure on your neck until it stops bleeding. He might bleed for a while. The fluid that his heart couldn't pump had settled in his liver and as a result, his body wasn't working well to make his blood clot. I didn't tell him this. Instead, I told him I was going to ask him to help me out by doing something. When I pull, I'm going to ask you to hum, I said. He looked up from his computer. Hum? It was the first time I'd heard his voice. He sounded so regular that I felt my own heart break a little. I explained that by humming, he would increase the pressure in his chest. This would decrease the chance that in the moment I pulled out the line, before I covered the tiny hole it would leave with a piece of gauze, an air bubble might enter his body, travel to his heart, and kill him before his disease would. 
Okay, he said. Hum. He looked amused. We had asked so much of him. This must have seemed silly in contrast. He closed his laptop and set it down on the bedside table. I can do that. I leaned over and gently peeled off the dressing that covered the spot where the line entered his neck. I used tiny forceps to lift the stitches and then cut them one by one. I had to lean in so close that I could hear him breathing. He smelled warm and a little bit like sweat, but not bad. It was time to take out the line. I lowered the head of his bed. You all right with that? I asked. Uh-huh, he said. One, two, three. Okay now, start humming. Mmm. I yanked out the line and covered the spot with gauze. A drop of blood dripped down his neck and I watched it land on his hospital gown. I moved the bed back into an upright position, my hand still on his neck. Just a minute or two, I told him. It was snowing outside. It was going to be a bad winter. Inside, it was quiet. Looks like Siberia, I said to fill the silence, gesturing out the window where snow had already blanketed the New York City street. My patient turned toward me into the pressure I held on his neck and flinched. Sorry, I said, just a little longer. He turned back. You know, I was in Siberia once, he said. Really? I continued to hold the gauze. It was the longest I had spent in a patient's room in weeks or months, maybe ever. He told me that he and some buddies had taken the Trans-Siberian Railway a few years back. They had traveled all over to places I had never seen, some I had never even heard of. That must have been amazing, I said. It was, he told me. It was awesome. Are you on Facebook? He asked. I posted the photos. I'll friend you. Then you can check them out. I lifted the piece of gauze. He had stopped bleeding. I covered the wound with fresh gauze and a piece of tape and dropped the large IV that had been inside him into the orange biohazard bin on the other side of the room. I would let the nurse know that I had soiled his gown. Yeah, I'm on Facebook, I said. Line's out. I'll go tell your nurse. Outside the room, I took a deep breath. I was sweating. I placed a big X in the empty box on the scut list. That went all right, my resident asked. Of course, I said. Pulling out a line was barely even a procedure. Totally fine. What's up next? When I got home that night, I logged on to Facebook to find a request from my patient waiting for me. I paused for a moment, then selected accept and clicked on his name. The patient whose line I had pulled earlier that day was puffy from fluid and steroids with a protruding belly and bruised arms and legs, but this boy on Facebook was healthy and good looking in a way that made me think of basketball and beer. He was single. He liked Radiohead and Tom Clancy. He had been sending updates from the ICU. You would have thought he was in the hospital with a sprained ankle, the way he joked, but I had held pressure on his neck that day and I knew the truth. I didn't enter his room the next day, nor did I tell any of my co-interns about his request. I almost did, but I thought better of it. It would have felt in a way like betraying a confidence. A week passed. On rounds, we talked about how his fever stopped and then returned. Hadn't been the line after all. My time in the cardiac ICU soon came to a close. I moved on to the general cardiology inpatient service, the next in my seemingly infinite intern year lineup of rotations. My days were full. I didn't often think of our exchange. But sometimes, at night, when I had opened my computer to log on to Facebook, I found myself flipping through my patient's photos or reading his status updates. They were unfailingly optimistic. Meanwhile, from his medical record, I learned that his fevers had continued, that his defibrillator kept going off that he was still waiting for a transplant that might never come. Then one day, at least a month later, I found a message waiting for me in my Facebook inbox. It was from him. He had written, can I stop humming yet? <laughs> so <clears throat> it's been many years now since that exchange, which took place during my intern year, but the story stayed with me, clearly. And ultimately, enough such that it became the title story of this book. And as I returned to this exchange years later, I had to wonder why it continued to resonate after so much time had passed. And I realized, I think, that this was the first time in that entire blur of intern year and of residency, really, that I paused and saw that these patients, these people with whom I intersected only in this moment of climax, these were people with pasts and futures. And I wanted to know more about them and to connect, but I didn't really know how. And as an intern, I didn't really understand any of that. And, and so this story, which I'll finish for you briefly here, is, is really one of regret. 
So there's a version of this story in which I replied, something friendly but restrained, and the next day I went back to the ICU to visit my patient. Maybe I would have sat down this time, we would have talked some more about the places he'd seen while traveling and what his life was like before and what he was hoping things would be like afterward, if he got the transplant, if he did not die. Perhaps if I had done this, he could have taught me a little bit about what it is to be 28 and in limbo, waiting for a transplant, for an infection, for a response to a message. Or maybe it would have been smaller than that, and I would have done nothing more than allay a bit of his boredom before heading to noon conference. But this isn't what happened. I started to type a reply, and then I stopped. Still not sure why. Maybe I knew that I had crossed some invisible barrier. Maybe I just didn't want all of those boxes on the scut list to expand into something real. I know it wouldn't have mattered to me if he looked at my photos or if he saw me with my friends wearing something silly or drinking champagne from the bottle on the way out for a night. It wasn't that. I was more uncomfortable with my own level of investment, with how well I knew his pictures and his updates. So I signed off. I stopped looking at his page too, scared that he would somehow sense my online footprints. Months passed. I didn't think of him until one evening in the spring when, on a whim, I returned to his Facebook page. The pictures and status updates I knew by heart had been replaced by dozens of messages of condolence. They stretched for pages, and I read each one. Then, knowing what I would find, I logged onto our online medical record system. After my rotation in the ICU had ended, my patient's heart rhythm had calmed, and he had made it briefly to the general medical floor. But then his heart failure had worsened, his kidneys had shut down, and he was started on dialysis. Ultimately, when it became clear that he was too sick to undergo a transplant, but that he would die without one, his parents and doctors had said, enough. He was dead, but his message in my, was still in my inbox, hopeful and waiting. I scrolled through his profile one more time, uncertain how long a Facebook page lingers after its owner dies, before closing my computer and going to sleep. So from residency, I went on to Pulmonary and Critical Care Fellowship in Boston. I had decided that I wanted to become an ICU doctor. And as I learned to become familiar with the interventions and procedures that could prolong life, the desire to understand how to connect with my patients, to know more about what came before and what might come after, grew more immediate to me. And this wasn't something that I learned in fellowship. I wanted to understand how people made decisions when faced with impossible choices, how they learned to adapt to unimaginable realities. And part of this drive came from the same curiosity that led me to accept that Facebook friend request, but I was driven too by the belief that only by learning the long-term effects of our interventions could I truly give advice and lead people through decisions as a doctor. And so I decided to find people who had survived, who had lived through critical illness or previously fatal diagnoses with tracheostomy tubes and transplanted organs and partial heart assist devices. And I wanted to learn more about their, what their lives were like, not just in the hospital or the outpatient clinic, but at home when the reality set in. And these are the stories that ultimately make up the rest of this book and what we're gonna talk about now. So we can move forward. <laughs> Thank you. Hear me? Can you hear me? There we go. So um, we're just going to have a little conversation uh, between Daniela and I, and then uh, we'll open it up to questions from you. So Daniela, I think that you you gave us a flavor of this in in that very moving passage that you shared with us. But in very in maybe broader terms, what compels you to write and to write this book in particular? All right. Oh, I did. I wasn't sure that I could figure out how to get that to work. Well, there you go. That ICU training is uh, really put to good use here. Um, and hopefully that's all it'll stay, is using my ICU training. So anyway, um, what compels me to write? So particularly this book. So as a, an ICU doctor, I became really interested in 
what happens after. You know, we don't really see the trajectory of illness. We see this sort of acute moment, and then our patients leave, and, and they're successful. They, they have left. Um, but I started to become really interested first um, to write about it and then to actually think clinically about how we can make things better afterwards. And, you know, I think why writing, um, I'd worked as a reporter for some period of time, um, and writing has always been to me um, a way to process, but also a public thing, like a way to communicate. Um, and so I felt as though there were all these stories that I saw in the hospital, but they weren't really part of sort of the public uh, compendium of stories that are very much life or death and not this, like, what happens after. You used, you used a word in, uh, in, in your remarks just now, limbo. Uh, that space between, right, between life and death where uh, medical technology is extending lives in ways that 20 years ago it wouldn't have. What's life like for somebody in that space today? You know, I think as much as I wanted to be able to answer that question, I mean, part of me feels like I can't ever really know. You know, I can only see uh, what it might look like, sort of these windows that I would get. But I think that there is this uh, tension between um, hope and optimism uh, and uh, fear and the reality that things might not be okay and that what okay might look like is maybe different than anybody uh, had expected. Um, and so for some of the patients in the book, life and what I had thought of as limbo, living with, say, a partial heart assist device, that what I thought of as limbo wasn't really limbo. It was a uh, life that looked different, but still got somebody where they wanted to be. And so I think for each person, what limbo is is different, and, and what is sort of acceptable is different, and that was kind of surprising to me over this process. Well, so let's talk about another one of your patients, then, sure. uh, Van Chauvin. Mm -hmm. So th tell us a little bit about his story and your experience with him. Yeah. So Van, um, it's a man's name, is a name of a, a man I met uh, who has a VAD had a VAD, a, a ventricular assist device, so something that would uh, allow his, take the place of his failing heart. And somebody can get a VAD in one of two ways, um, either as the way they will live until they die, called a destination VAD, or as something to sort of keep them going while waiting for a heart transplant. And I was really interested in the VAD as a piece of technology because it leaves the hospital, you live with it, and it means that you actually have to plug into a wall socket uh, each night uh, while your batteries recharge. And that like very obvious sort of juxtaposition of something that is uh, so human, you know, your heart, uh, but also sort of so mechanical plugging in uh, was interesting to me. And I wanted to know sort of what did it mean to live that way. And so I met a man named Van uh, who had initially gotten this device hoping that this would get him to transplant, ultimately didn't end up becoming a candidate for a transplant and learned that this device is what he would live with. And you know, my sort of bias coming in, my perception was that living this way is limbo and Van would be furious that he had made this decision for an outcome that wasn't ever gonna come to pass. But that wasn't it at all. And uh, what he ended up telling me was that waiting on the transplant list for him was the worst. Like he had to go into all these appointments. He had to be told what to do. He had to follow all these orders. And once somebody told him transplant was off the table and this was it, it was life with his VAD, he was able to live. He made some compromises. He uh, placed his quality of life over pure safety uh, a bunch of times. Um, but he was able to, to live that way. Because, well, how did he place his life in jeopardy? Yeah, so, so with a VAD, you're supposed to be really careful about water. Uh, the, the cord exits your abdomen and goes to, um, you have some battery packs that you carry. And so you're supposed to shower very quickly. And you probably shouldn't be in a body of water. And people are specifically told, like, don't go swimming, don't go boating. Van loved his boat. And he loved being out on a lake near his home. And once he was told he wasn't on the transplant list, he started rehabbing a boat, and that summer he was on it. So uh, you mentioned uh, your experience as a, uh, as a reporter mm -hmm. uh, in Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that contribute to your ability to write a book like this? Yeah. I mean, I think it gave me, in some way, just first the idea that I could, that uh, when you go into people's worlds and say that you want to write about them. They don't just like kick you out, maybe. I mean, I'm sure they do in some contexts, but, um, but in this kind of context, they don't. And, and I think that sort of the same thing that made me want to 
report, which is sort of being curious uh, what happens behind the scenes, you know, kind of wanting to ask questions and wanting to just kind of like sit there and listen and observe. Um, that was probably the same drive that brought me, you know, to these patients' houses that made me uh, want to have dinner with them. It, it, are these, so are the, are the folks that you write about in the book, are these folks that, um, these are folks that you reached out to or you reached out to their families mm -hmm. after they were in your care? This, you, yes. It's not like you walked into somebody's patient room and said, oh, I'm going to write a chapter about you, right? That would be... Right, and that's an awkward thing about the idea of a doctor who writes. Um, so for this, I was I played it pretty safe, and by that I mean... Um, the people, who, there are a few people, like that first uh, gentleman whose story I shared with you from the Facebook story, uh, his name and identifying details have been changed. However, all of the uh, conversation and definitely that Facebook exchange, that's all accurate. And so, you know, it's not clear. So that's identifying in a way, if you knew it, but, but he's, he's died. And so... So that was that was sort of hard, and I think that that really gets to like this this tension. And but for most of these, um, I approached people afterwards, and for a few of them, I actually uh, had sort of briefly intersected with them, but I had never cared for them. So I'm not a cardiologist, so I'd never cared for Van, the man with the VAD, for instance. Um, most of the other ones I had intersected with in the hospital, but then came to them very clearly as you know, I might have known you in this way, but now I'm a reporter. So let's, uh, so I'm going to, we're going to open the floor to questions here in just a couple of minutes, but I want to ask you about another, another uh, patient. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking of Andrea DeMeo Clancy and her son, Ben. Mm -hmm. uh, opioid overdoses are big and uh, it's, a, it's a huge challenge across the country, certainly in this part of the, of the United States. Talk to us about Ben and, uh, and, and his case. Yeah. So the genesis of this story is that I work, I do some work, I'm in the ICU, but I'm also in a long-term acute care hospital caring for patients who are, have uh, prolonged needs for uh, being on a ventilator. And in both settings, I have seen increasingly uh, young people who overdose, uh, who are saved by miraculous technology, um, who, whose bodies are cooled, who are resuscitated, uh, and who live uh, because they're young, um, but they are left with significant brain injury. And I wanted to, and that's tragic, but also interesting too, because there's this, this uncertainty built into brain injury where at the outset, you just, you just don't know what's gonna happen. Um, and there's this big window of possibility. Could this person end up who they were like uh, before, mostly? Or are they gonna be very different? Is this somebody who's gonna have an independent life? And, and I wanted to know what it is like to be the family of somebody like that, navigating that uncertainty. And so I found such a, a patient um, and parent uh, in a young man named Ben, who was a college student who suffered an overdose, um, and his mom, Andrea. And I talk about them. Can you tell us a little sure. bit about the about the case? Yeah, so so Ben, um, I never knew him before, but I'm told he was a, a very uh, charismatic, witty, uh, loud uh, guy um, who loved eating, loved making sandwiches, um, and he went away to college. Uh, and his family's actually uh, yeah, they're this is you know in the book, not private. They're they're in uh, near Rhode Island actually, um, and so he went away to college, got into drugs a little bit, came home, his parents did the very best they could, um, and he was struggling to get a job, finally got a job, went out and partied the weekend before he was to start work, and his parents got a call that he was at the uh, emergency department at Mass General Hospital and might not live. And uh, so, hell. Um, and at first they were just worried, would he die? Uh, and as days went on and he didn't die and he woke up a little bit, their hopes expanded, like would Ben actually be okay. And when I met him, it was about five months in, and he wasn't okay the way he had been before, but he was progressing. He could talk a little bit. He was at home, had a physical therapist, learning to walk a little, learning to make a sandwich. Um, and that's sort of where I have him in the book. Um, and I've followed his family and him as time have passed. And Unfortunately, and I've learned that this is something that happens with brain injury sometimes, you know, without the aggressive rehab, with other insults like small pneumonias and infections, he plateaued and then worsened. 
Uh, so he's, I think the window of possibility of what things can look like is smaller than it was in this book. So for those of us who are, um, you know, not, we're not critical care doctors, mm-hmm. um, and we may or may not have had experiences sort of in this, in this limbo uh, in our families, what's a, what, what do you want the, just the average reader to take away from your book? Yeah, so, you know, I went into the book thinking that when I found these people, when I sort of left the hospital and went to their homes, I would find people who maybe regretted decisions they had made, who thought, you know, this isn't what my life should look like. It's not what I found. I mean, this is a biased sample of people who let me into their worlds, clearly, but there are people who made meaning out of situations that weren't anything that they had expected. And and I think what that taught me is that you know, of course, any of us or our family members might face illness and injury at some point, and what we're willing to tolerate and what kind of lives we'd find acceptable is different from person to person. And I think knowing about what kind of some of these paths might look like, what it could be, which is what I try to tell in this book, hopefully that can help us think about, you know, what would I do? What would I do if this were me, if this were my loved one? There's no one right answer. It's very personal. But thinking a little bit about that, making sure that you talk to your doctors about that, and making sure that doctors, like myself, ask these questions of people and then choose interventions that are appropriate, I think would be a start. Uh, And that's what I tried to do with this. All right. So I'm going to do my best Jimmy Kimmel impersonation now, or Jimmy Fallon, one of the Jimmys. So if you've got a question, raise your hand. I'll come to you. I've got more questions. I can go all night. Here we go. Um, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank um, you. My name's Kelly. Being that it's October, I'll start us off. I am a breast cancer survivor. Thanks to Brigham and Williams. I'm nervous. Um, um, Brigham and Women's Hospital saved my life five years ago. Does anybody talk to you about the cancer zone? Um, when we were diagnosed with breast cancer, they said, you are now a survivor. You've been diagnosed. You're on your way. To healing, and I did find that for five years, I was a cancer survivor. Hmm. So there's a mentality there where you do kick in to his own. I'm just curious if you've encountered that with other people. So the question is whether, and my best to you, and congratulations to you, um, is whether I uh, sort of have encountered something described as a cancer zone. So this idea that you have been through something horrible and you sort of, that's going to be part of your definition of self for some period of time. Is that accurate? Um, you know, so, so uh, in the ICU at the Brigham, I do take care of a lot of uh, patients um, who've come in through Dana-Farber. So I see cancer a lot. Um, and I don't see people afterwards with cancer quite so much. And I felt... You know, I, I've made in my head some parallels to some of the to cancer with some of the diseases people have here in this book, and I think one of the significant differences is that if somebody's been through the ICU, they don't really define themselves as an ICU survivor, and so even if that experience has is you know key and and sort of leads to all of these changes in their life, uh, that isn't sort of there isn't a, an identity around that um, right now. And so I think I don't see it quite, you know, we don't have a structured system of ICU survivor support, uh, let's say. Um, and so I think that I understand what you say, and I think that that exists for these people, but I don't think that we have quite as uh, precise language for it. Good evening, doctor. Is this one? Hi, Stephen Maloney. We've never met, but I've communicated with you electronically. Oh, it's great to see you in person. How are you? Great. Well, I should let everyone know I'm a big, uh, well, a big fan of your book. Listen to me. I was very... I know. You can say that. Just <laughs> put, it, put it into the microphone. It's good I stuff. I am very, yeah, very yeah, yeah. impressed. What'd you say? Very impressed. Well, first of all, I know everyone likes books that are, you know, compelling and well-written, which yours is. I love books where I learn something. I learn so much about the... Critically, chronically ill, I guess there's 100,000 at any one time in the country. Um, You mentioned that maybe one in 10, which is a pretty slim number, really have any semblance of life. What I wanted to say was um, what really struck me about your book is that people rivet on the personal stories, and rightfully so. What I really liked was the fact that this conversation that we need to have 
um, you've already started to have it, and, and it's, it's there in the book, a little understated, but you're holding clinics. You're meeting with patients now. Um, you, for one, uh, have been a leader identifying the intensive care post-traumatic uh, uh, post, post stress syndrome. Um, where, where do you think we go? I, I, I think your book is a great first step um, to having this conversation, which, by the way, I, I always have to remind folks when I start to talk to them about it, it's, diff it's, it's, it's a bit like, but it's different from the end-of-life yeah. conversation. So where do we go from here? I mean, short, uh, short and it's great, you're a public policy uh, form, you know, short of government intervention and setting policy on, on the critically, chronically ill, where do we go from here? So, great question. Um, where do we go from here? And, I'll, you know, I think you had a microphone so people can hear you. Um, also, big fan. And I am a big fan of yours, so thank you so much. Um, you know, I think it's a great question. And, and I don't really, um, you know, I don't know the answer. You know, my... So what what you're alluding to or mentioning specifically is that there's a couple of groups of patients or people uh, that I describe in the book. The term chronically critically ill are people who um, have survived an acute critical illness uh, but continue to have a prolonged need for life support technologies like a tracheostomy tube to connect to a ventilator. Um, and these uh, people who number at least 100,000 in the country at any one time um, if they still need the ventilator for weeks to months after the acute critical illness, um, it's a heterogeneous group, but overall, about one in 10 will be alive and functionally independent in a year's time. And for people who even look okay after the ICU, they face things like post-traumatic stress, anxiety, depression, cognitive dysfunction from people who've been really sick in an ICU, potentially. And, you know, I think knowing that, just knowing that, just knowing that and educating about that is important. I also think that that knowledge reflects back to what we do in the ICU. You know, we're better than we were five, ten years ago about minimizing sedation because we know that that's associated with some of these worse outcomes. Um, you know, I think uh, we try increasingly, though I... I really don't know what the right time is to integrate some of these possible outcomes into conversations with families about what might be ahead. Um, and then I think setting up structures to catch some of these problems afterwards. Um, we are sort of building this post-ICU clinic where we try to screen for some of these issues for people who are home, not for the chronically critically ill really, but people who are able to come back to clinic. And. I think that's kind of where I'm at, and I know that there is a bigger picture, and I don't, but I don't fully know the answer to your question yet. So if there's questions, show me your hand and I'll come to you. But Danielle, I wonder if you could answer a question for me at this point. What do these stories tell us about what it means to be human? Small little question. Yeah, just a, a little quick question. Um, I mean, at the risk of sounding uh, cliche, which I guess sort of biases you to begin with, I mean, People, uh, people are like amazing. Uh, you know, I mean, I uh, came at these stories with the great luxury of being uh, relatively young as a doctor. I mean, I'm not really that young, but as a doctor, I'm like still youngish because people are young until they're like 50. But, um, but uh, as you know, we train forever. We're, we don't really have a real job till we're 40. So. <laughs> um, uh, so, so, you know, I, and, and healthy, and so I can't come to these stories with, with a luxury of sort of wondering, like, what is life like? Um, and, and people are, like, amazingly graceful and adaptable, and being human doesn't really seem necessarily, you know, you can have all of these machines, but I think when they're, that person and what they like and what they care about is still there, um, that... Uh, that allows that human being to, to come through. I mean, I see that a lot at this long-term care hospital where I work, um, where there are people who uh, are able to communicate only by mouthing, and yet it is fun to talk to them because they're like people. Uh, these are you know people with interesting personalities that you can uh, connect with. So, I don't know, it's a challenge. Thank you. 
Dr. Lamas, thank you so, so much for coming to Salve Regina University. My name is Myra Edelstein. I'm a professor of business studies, um, and I teach healthcare administration. And several of my students are in the room right now, or at least they're supposed to be. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I have a question. Uh, my students and I are studying uh, healthcare quality. And I was wondering where you deal on a daily basis with chronic illness and, and right on that brink of life and death, how do you measure quality in healthcare and what are some of the measures that you look for? Yeah. Thank so that's you. a great question, quality in healthcare in these settings. Um, you know, it's that, I mean, that's a, an ongoing, not to like deflect your question, but if you have an answer, I'd love to hear it. I mean, that's an ongoing big challenge. You know, so we try to, for studies and stuff like this, measure, uh, the term would be goal concordant care. So people uh, receiving the care that they want. But that is like so hard to measure because what people want changes over time and you can't ask them at the moment they're receiving it. You know, but that would be, that's that's the goal is to, is to make sure that people uh, receive the care, whatever that is. Maybe that means being really aggressive. Maybe that doesn't mean being really aggressive. It doesn't actually matter. There's not like a judgment on it. Uh, it's just whatever each person uh, wants based on decisions that take into account, you know, their medical realities and sort of a realistic view. Um, you know, I, I worry that increasingly, and, you know, I, I have to sort of think about the way I'm saying this, but as an ICU doctor, I worry that increasingly there's the perception that using ICU resources uh, for somebody who might have a short uh, lifespan uh, due to, say, metastatic cancer or something like that, that that's viewed as not the right thing to do. And that, you know, when you look at studies and they uh, sort of measurements of quality are increasingly, uh, you know, if you are in the ICU in the last, say, month or, or, or couple months of life, that's like a ding on quality uh, in big studies. And I don't think that's the way it should be because for some people that is the right thing. And so I think we need to find some better way to gauge quality uh, that is more nuanced, but I don't know what that is. You're welcome. Other questions? Danielle, I wonder if you could also uh, help me though. Uh, so the critics have loved this book. Uh, what kind of response have you gotten from people as you've been out doing talks like this or others, what, what are people telling you about the book? I mean, I think people are telling me that, um, that, that you all should buy it. I'm actually totally kidding. <laughs> I was just buying time. It's no big deal. Um, so, uh, that, you know, I think, I think these are stories, um, that people haven't necessarily heard and that there is some sort of information here that people think is interesting. Um, and uh, that some of these patients and their families are just likable, which is sort of what I had hoped, that there's both something that's interesting, because it's interesting to me, but also that there are good stories about people. Not sure exactly how to ask this question, uh, but um, you read about near-death experiences, uh, miraculous healings, uh, uh, that you've done things to, uh, scientifically, uh, but then the, the patient uh, is healed, not because you've done something, uh, uh, but I don't know whether you've had experiences with that uh, type of thing, and if you have any comments along that line. Sure, about miraculous experiences, um, or sort of near, you know, I'm thinking. Um, I think that often, uh, or not maybe often, but uh, not infrequently are there things that we can't fully explain. Um, but I think that sort of the things that I see that I can't fully, and, and people do get better that we don't think we're going to get better. That, that's, that's true. Um, I think that there's always sort of the okay to hope for something, uh, miraculous. I think though that, um, the challenge is often sort of ha having that hopefulness, but then having the backup plan if it doesn't come to pass. Um. You know, I think, though, that sometimes when I think about the things that I can't explain, it's sort of other things like, you know, I was in the ICU somewhat recently, and um, somebody's father, I think it was a father, uh, was, or somebody's mother, it's inconsequential, but mother w was dying, and um, she couldn't get in touch with the 
woman's husband with her father and wanted the, you know, it felt like it would have been important for the father to be there. And I think he was sleeping at home and she couldn't wake him up because like he turns his phone off or something like this. And she wanted to get an Uber to come and bring him to the hospital before the mother died. And it wasn't going to happen. And we were all like, how are we going to do this? You know, we had already sort of up meds to protract this ending to hope that the father would get there. Anyway, so then we're in this family meeting trying to figure out, like, how can we make this okay for everybody? And her phone starts ringing. And the dad had a, a dream that, the, uh, that his wife was talking to him. And he woke up and he thought that he needed to call and see what was going on. And we told him over the phone and he's, he was okay. Um, and so that, to me, was totally... Like, I can't explain that. Um, and maybe it's not the same kind of miracle as somebody, like, standing up and saying I'm okay, but that felt somewhat miraculous to me, too. Yes, ma'am. Um, how has your, your knowledge... Your, um, okay. How has... The, the knowledge that you've gotten from these patients, the stories, their stories, how has it changed you? It's, and, it, and how has it changed you in the way that you teach your students, your med students? Okay. So how has it changed me or the way I teach my med students? I mean, I think I really do try, and I'm not, I don't always succeed, but you know, I think I do try and, uh, make sure that we, in a structured fashion, um, take the time to find out who our patients are. And often in the unit, that's not through the patients themselves, but through their families, um, such that and what their goals are and what would be acceptable to them, because those over time are sort of the core values that are going to dictate what is the appropriate uh, care to give over time. And so I think sort of building that in, you know, in the beginning of my training, I definitely felt like, you know, do everything, everything, everything. And then I sort of swung the opposite way and thought, oh, I'm doing too much, do less, do less. And like, neither of those are true. Like, figure out what is appropriate and then sort of without judgment, um, try to help people achieve their goals, even if those aren't the goals that are the same as you would have for yourself or somebody you love. So I'm a hypochondriac. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll just get, we'll Sorry. stipulate that up front. And so I'm kind of fearful about going to hospitals because I don't want to get sick. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also just sort of a, 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 a just such, a, such a seriousness, a, a life and death quality, particularly, I remember when I visited my dad in the ICU when he was having a heart procedure done, it was just was high stress. Someone who lives there, works there every day, how do you cope? Um, you know, I think there's this odd, like sometimes when I'm in the ICU, I am aware of these this juxtaposition or this dichotomy, I guess, between the degree to which it is high stress and the fact that we're able somehow to acknowledge that stress and to have it there and to turn on when we really need to. But uh, we also are able, not because it comes becomes rote, because you always care and you're always scared um, because that's appropriate, but you're also able to deal with humor, with connecting with families who are like fun and funny, patients to whatever extent they're awake, who can be like fun to talk to. The colleagues are fun to talk to. You know, I see nurses are like amazing. Um, and so, and also like often funny. And so I think that, uh, you know, just sort of people being human beings in the setting of extreme stress is something that people get increasingly good at. I, I had an overnight shift, I think, on Sunday night. And I walked in and my group of residents um, who are excellent residents, I mean, these are Brigham residents, they're fantastic, and they were sitting in the resident lounge and they were watching Planet Earth because the unit was quiet and they were just like fixated on Planet Earth. And, you know, it's like, huh, this is a, a funny, you know, sometimes they just watch puppies. Um, and so, uh, so that, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, what, do you have any other books up your, uh, in your quill, hmm. as it were? So my, my electronic quill, I guess. Um, yeah, I sure hope so. Uh, so I, I keep telling somebody, like the, the literary agent guy that I do. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm uh, telling you I'm a, a big medical thriller fan. And so um, I have been thinking increasingly, I mean, I have in my head, like I can't say it out loud because it'll sound dumb and then disappear. So I'm holding off. But um, 
a medical thriller idea that deals with, actually deals with some of the um, unintended consequences of um, quality metrics and incentives that I don't think are what they should be. Uh, you got a lot of uh, current students in the room tonight. Advice to folks who are thinking about careers in healthcare. Yeah. I mean, I think it's been a good choice. Um, I think uh, go for it. You know, and and I think uh, there's there's clearly a ton of complexity in healthcare. There are things that are not ideal, nor necessarily in the or not at all in the patient's best interest. Um, that that are are going on in a big picture sense. But I think that that ultimately um, the power and the honor really to um, be with a person in these sort of, sort of worst and I don't know if you go into OB like maybe best um, moments of somebody's life is it's like a it's a pretty cool uh, cool thing to do. So say good luck. Uh, she's Dr. Daniela Lamas. The book is You Can Stop Humming Now. It's for sale in the lobby. She's going to stick around and sign some. She'll be happy to talk to you as well. A round of applause for Dr. Daniela Lamas. <laughs>